So my name is Meredith Kwok. I am the Associate Director of Alumni and Constituent Relations for the Program in Public Health here at UCI. And this is the UCI Public Health Lunchtime Lecture Series, Episode 9. As you know, the intention of our series is to inform and engage our community in the public health efforts that are happening right here in our backyard by highlighting the work of our staff and faculty in an easy to digest manner over lunch. This one, unfortunately, may not be as easy to digest, but we are so lucky to have a very special guest here today. So as you know, our time together is very short. Um, this will be recorded for future viewing purposes. Our guest will present and then he will open up the conversation for questions using the Q&A function below. So the Q&A, please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Let's get started. David Salelas joined UC Irvine in August 2020 to serve as the director of the UCI COVID-19 response team. In this role, he provides public health policy advice and guidance to the campus, guidance on campus COVID-19 asymptomatic testing programs, and he manages the UCI COVID-19 contact tracing program. David has worked in public health for over 30 years, Prior to joining UCI, he most recently held the position of Deputy Agency Director of Public Health Services with the Orange County Healthcare Agency. In this role, he served as Public Health Director for the county. David previously served as HCA Chief of Public Health Operations and as Division Manager for Disease Control and Epidemiology. In addition to working for UC Irvine, David is also an anteater he earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from UC Irvine and holds his MPH from UCLA. We won't hold that against you, David. Thank you. Back. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. I turn the virtual floor over to you. Great. Thank you, Meredith. So happy to be here. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I wanted to take uh, a little bit of time today to talk to you about our UCI uh, campus COVID-19 response and um, the work that we've been doing to really try and make our campus community as safe as possible during this very uh, difficult time and particularly at this most difficult time uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really globally and certainly in this country and here in California and right here in Orange County. So appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with all of you today. Um, before I dive into the specifics of our um, response on campus, I thought it would be useful to just set the stage and remind us all what we're dealing with um, in terms of this pandemic and where we're at. Um, in terms of the United States, more than 15 million um, cases have been reported to date through December 9th. Um, with over 285,000 deaths, really just a staggering number of, of deaths and loss of life. And, you know, every one of those people represents somebody who belonged to someone's family, lived in someone's community, just a, a, a tremendous level uh, of loss for our country in terms of, of the impact of this, of, of this disease. In uh, California, uh, we've seen over 1.4 uh, million cases. Um, uh, as reported yesterday, over 30,000 cases had been reported uh, that particular day in uh, California, um, almost um, over 20,000 deaths um, in California as well. And one of the things, and I think you all have been hearing this uh, if you've been paying attention to the news, um, is that we have really seen an escalation in uh, COVID activity in the last month or so, really a significant increase in the number of cases, um, the number of hospitalizations, the number of uh, individuals in uh, intensive care units. Um, so really a, a, a significant surge in case activity. I think things are probably worse now than they have been at any point in the pandemic here in the United States in terms of, of what we're seeing in terms of cases and, and hospitalizations in particular. Um, in California, our uh, testing positivity rate, 14-day uh, positivity rate has been about 8.7% recently. That's up significantly over the last month. 
Hospitalizations have increased 70.8% in the last 14 days in California, and ICU hospitalizations have increased almost uh, 68%, a little over 68% uh, in the last uh, 14 days. And I think all of this really led the state of California to take the most recent actions it did in terms of um, creating the regional stay at home orders uh, to really try and break the chain of infection that's going on um, throughout um, California and to try and bring uh, those numbers back down by reducing the opportunities for the virus to spread. Um, that trigger is a 15% trigger. So if a region's uh, intensive care unit beds drop below 15% availability, a region is placed into the regional stay at home order. Um, California is in is under or excuse me, Orange County is under the regional uh, stay at home order now. And I just checked a few minutes ago before joining um, uh, this session and our our uh, ICU uh, percentage available in uh, the Southern California region is down to 7.7%. So it's continuing um, uh, to actually become less and less in terms of the available uh, ICU uh, beds in, um, in uh, the Southern California region. Here in um, Orange County, um, we have seen 93,000 uh, cumulative cases since uh, the pandemic began. Uh, Orange County saw one of the first cases of COVID-19 back in late January. I think we were the second or third case in the United States reported here in uh, Orange County. Over 2,600 um, cases reported uh, yesterday, which I believe was a new record for Orange County, um, bringing, bringing a, a new record high in terms of daily reported cases. And here in Orange County as well, over um, 1,600 uh, deaths since the, the pandemic uh, had, has begun. Our testing positivity rate here in Orange County um, is at about 10.6% uh, overall. So um, definitely has been increasing in recent days as well. So that's really just to set the stage. And, and I will tell you that um, we have seen increased um, case activity here at UCI among students, staff, and faculty, both those that work and live on campus, but also our, our students who are off campus and our staff and faculty who are working uh, remotely. You can check out the, um, the university's public facing dashboard at uci.edu um, to, to look and, and be able to track um, our um, cases that we report out amongst our um, students who live on campus and our staff and faculty uh, working on campus. We have seen 244 of those since uh, March uh, of this year, a significant number of those in the last uh, four weeks really um, matching the escalation of what we've seen in, um, in Orange County and California and around uh, the country as well. So when we think about um, how we are operating here at UCI and trying to um, uh, carry on with our research and educational missions, um, the university really has looked at um, layers of protection to hope to, to work to reduce the spread of COVID-19. So it's not just one strategy um, that we are employing to try and create as safe of a, a campus environment as possible, but really a whole series of strategies that layer on top of each other to uh, allow us to provide as protective of an environment as possible. And all of this done is all of this is done in the context of um, the greater um, uh, Orange County community and California community in terms of um, uh, making sure that all we do is in conformity with um, state and uh, local orders. So one of the things we did at the outset when we were looking at bringing students back to campus to reside on campus uh, for the fall quarter was to consider the density of our housing and really wanted to bring that density down to, to, to create less opportunities for COVID to be able to spread within our housing uh, communities. And uh, we cut 
by over half um, the number of residents that typically reside on campus uh, for the fall quarter. And we created single room occupancy so that um, nobody is sharing a room um, but has their own room. And again, uh, really a strategy that helps us to reduce um, uh, transmission within our housing units. Um, we have also created, uh, as part of that, our, um, our ZOT pods within housing units to allow students to create um, uh, smaller social groupings within their housing units that, that um, they can socialize with throughout uh, the academic year, uh, but to reduce the opportunities for lots of interaction among students across different housing units and, and within residence halls so that we, again, hopefully can work to reduce the opportunities for COVID to spread within our community. Uh, we shifted to predominantly online classes for the fall quarter. We did have um, some instructional opportunity available in person consistent with where Orange County was um, in terms of status of the pandemic um, back when the um, when uh, classes began in the fall. Um, since we've moved to the stay at home order, we have gone, um, we have dialed that back and many of those uh, in person class offerings have now been uh, taken back remotely as well. Again, reducing opportunities for um, transmission while people are on campus and, and taking classes. Um, we've developed um, enhanced cleaning and sanitation practices consistent with uh, Cal OSHA standards and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidance on cleaning and sanitation. Uh, we've reduced our building occupancy for remaining in-person activities. So uh, a building, for instance, that might previously have held 100 people uh, may be rated um, to only hold 20 or 30 now based on the configuration of the building and the need to be able, be able to create opportunities for occupants in those spaces to physically uh, distance. Uh, we have implemented um, policies requiring face coverings, uh, as well as the physical distancing that I mentioned. We know these are really two key tools to reducing the spread of COVID-19, not only on campus, but in our communities. Uh, that is why um, you have seen um, the real push for uh, individuals to wear face coverings whenever they're out in public and around other um, individuals, uh, particularly if they're going to be closer than six feet. Um, it uh, really helps to not only uh, protect you, but also to protect you from infecting other people should you be um, infected and not know it, which we know a large number of people are what we call asymptomatic. So they may be infected with COVID, not know it, but be able to spread it to others. And the, the face coverings, the masking, the physical distancing really go a long way to reducing the opportunities for COVID to spread from person to person. Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is always important in any communicable disease, and it's just as important here uh, with uh, COVID-19. So continuing to encourage good hand hygiene works for colds, works for flu, works for COVID. Um, just an important practice that we continue to re-emphasize. Daily symptom checkers. So if you're a student, staff, or faculty member here on campus, we're asking you to complete the daily symptom checker. Uh, this is really one of our first lines of defense. And the goal here is that if you have symptoms, we do not want you coming to work or to school. Um, and we want you to be um, evaluated to determine if a COVID test is necessary. Um, and if so, we, um, through our systems, we'll make arrangements for that testing um, to occur. But really, um, this gets back to that practice that we've all heard, and most of us have been really bad at for most of our lives, which is if you're sick, stay home. A lot of us with our work ethics, with our school ethics, are used to working through the illness. Um, and that is just um, a particularly dangerous behavior in this day and time. It, it's always been a challenge for us from a public health perspective, but with COVID, the stakes are much higher. So we really want people, if they are um, not feeling well, if they're experiencing symptoms, to stay home. If you're a student, we'll arrange for evaluation uh, through Student Health uh, Center. If you're a faculty or staff member, we have an evaluation opportunity through the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. And then we have the ability to arrange for testing through UCI for you for COVID. 
Um, as I said, testing, we offer both symptomatic testing. So anybody who reaches out um, through the daily symptom checker or contacts student health directly or Center for Occupational and Environmental Health directly, um, we can make arrangements for symptomatic testing. Uh, we've also um, established a significant asymptomatic testing program, a, a testing surveillance program. So we have uh, for our students who live on campus or 6,700 campus residents. Uh, weekly testing has been in place for some time now. Um, we are increasing the availability of that asymptomatic testing to include off-campus students. We're phasing in the first group of those this week. And we've also begun offering asymptomatic testing to our essential workers on campus and increasing uh, those numbers as well. Again, the goal with asymptomatic testing is really um, with the understanding that people can be infected and not know it. So you may not have symptoms and we want to be able to identify anybody who may be COVID positive, whether they have symptoms or not, because they have the ability uh, to be able to transmit to other people. And then contact tracing, which I'll talk about in uh, uh, a little bit more depth uh, in a couple of minutes and what that entails, but our, our efforts to be able to identify those who are close contacts of cases uh, and be able to quarantine them and, and help to break the chain of infection. And then finally, isolation and quarantine support. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as well. But this is basically the practice of isolating the COVID person, uh, the COVID positive individual. Um, so they're no longer able to be around individuals and transmit to other people, but then to quarantine those who have been in close contact. So should they develop COVID, um, they're not um, circulating in the community and potentially transmitting to other people. All of this, all of these layers are really designed to work together to help reduce the likelihood of COVID um, transmitting uh, amongst our campus community. And then finally, all of this is done consistent with uh, compliance with California Department of Public Health Institutions of Higher Education um, guidance, as well as applicable state and um, local county public health uh, orders. So in terms of contact tracing, which is a really a key component of our strategy here on campus and, uh, and was a, a real important um, priority that the university established um, when thinking about bringing students back to campus for the fall quarter, um, was to be able to have some ability to uh, um, quickly and effectively do contact tracing uh, of our campus student staff and faculty of our campus community um, to re be able to, as I said, break that chain of infection. Contact tracing is typically a county public health function here in California. And we actually have an agreement with the Orange County Healthcare Agency, which is our local health department, um, to conduct COVID-19 contact tracing for the campus population. So we're essentially operating as an extension of the local health department to carry out contact tracing for our campus communities. And the reason why contact tracing is so important and the ability to do it timely and quickly is so important is because COVID is really a fast moving disease. Um, the amount of time between infection and start of symptoms can be about five days on average. Um, the amount of time uh, infectiousness can begin before symptoms. If you're experiencing symptoms, you can be infectious for about two days before your symptoms begin. And the amount of time between close contact with an infectious person and the possibility of onward transmission is um, about three days. So we really have a very small window of opportunity to identify our COVID-19 positive individuals and their close contacts if we want to get people um, successfully um, uh, successfully isolated and quarantined to break that chain of infection. And this is just another um, uh, illustration. So if our person F1 is the person with COVID-19, we would interview that individual. We would want to identify all of their close contacts who would be F2, and we would want to quarantine those individuals for 14 days from their last point of contact with F1. And the reason we want to do that is because if we don't, and they become 
uh, COVID positive and infectious, they're able to then to spread to their close contacts, all of these other folks. So you can see how quickly uh, COVID-19 can spread within a community. And it's really what we're seeing happening now in the country is really an, ex uh, an exponential escalation of COVID-19 infections occurring in this country. So contact tracing done timely and, um, and effectively can really help uh, to break the chain of infection. So we have built our, uh, as I said, our contact tracing program here at um, UCI using a, a variety of different teams that work with us to do the contact tracing, the case interviews and the contact interviews that need to be done. We have a, a group of uh, uh, graduate fellows from the Department of uh, Teaching Excellence and Innovation, the DTEI fellows. Um, we have a core group of temporary employment services staff. We're working here full-time with our contact tracing program. We have other graduate students and uh, the Ann Ader EMS Club who have all, all um, asked to really be a part of the response and are volunteering with us. They have all taken the UCI program in public health, health equity contact tracing training, as well as additional training from us um, to be contact tracers and to work with our program. So essentially with contact tracing, reports come in through a variety of ways that I've sort of described already. Uh, we have this, the student symptom checker, uh, which results in symptomatic testing, the employee symptom checker, which results in symptomatic testing. Um, we have uh, the campus asymptomatic testing program. We have students or employees who self-report their um, COVID status because they've tested off campus. And then we have reports that come to us from the Orange County Healthcare Agency well as well. So cases that were reported to them that we may not otherwise know about. All of that is reported electronically to our um, contact tracing program that allows us then to do the case investigation interviews and then isolate our cases and quarantine the close contacts, thereby helping to reduce the spread of further infection in our community. So when we do our uh, uh, contact tracing, all of our cases, those who are COVID-19 positive are interviewed. Isolation instructions are given to those individuals. Their needs are identified with a plan to solve those needs so that they can successfully uh, isolate. Uh, possible so exposure sources are identified. That really helps us to understand if we have clusters of cases occurring in a common source point. Close contacts are identified and the close contacts are called and interviewed and instructed to quarantine. Um, so what are the needs that we see? Well, there are a whole variety of needs, um, housing needs in particular to decompress crowded living situations. So not as big of a problem on campus because we have everybody in uh, single rooms. And when a person is COVID positive, we have a whole bank of isolation apartments available to move them to. And then our, our folks who need to quarantine on campus can quarantine in place in their rooms. But oftentimes in off-campus housing, um, our students may be living in a two bedroom, one bath apartment with four or five other individuals. And we need to really reduce the number of people in that residence to um, allow people to be able to safely isolate and quarantine. So we can offer isolation and quarantine oftentimes opportunities for off-campus students uh, to isolate and quarantine on campus. Uh, thermometers for being able to do daily uh, temperature checks. Uh, food is a, an issue and we have um, provisions both on campus for um, assessing uh, food opportunities and food delivery um, options uh, as needed. Uh, academic assistance, mental health support, family support, laundry, medication, pet care, you name it, a whole variety of issues. Um, come up and we try to address as best we can with the resources that we have in the campus community, uh, really to assure that people can safely and effectively isolate and quarantine. That is really key to breaking the chain of infection. And there is a whole support network of partners that work with us to do that um, from human resources and the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health on the employee, staff and faculty side, the Student Health Center with the students, uh, residence life um, and campus social work and dining services and student affairs, uh, campus athletics to uh, help assure our athletic our athletes are appropriately um, tested and protected, um, consistent with all the guidelines that apply to athletics. Our partners at the medical center who do a big bulk of our uh, COVID testing. It really takes 
this whole team to support effective uh, isolation and quarantine on the campus so that we can help to break the chain of infection and keep our campus as safe and as healthy as possible. Um, so with that, I will um, bring my remarks to a close and just say, uh, you know, it is all about communication and um, doing those basic steps that we can all do uh, to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 within our campus community, but also within our greater community overall. The university, I think, has built a tremendous uh, infrastructure to be able to support um, bringing our campus back to uh, operation as um, state and local public health guidelines allow us to, and hopefully these structures will uh, continue to be in place for us going into the future to allow us to become uh, a more active and engaged and populated uh, campus in the future. You know, we're looking forward to the opportunity uh, to see the vaccine roll out in the coming months, and that will definitely be a game changer for this country. Um, but I will say, and just to caution everybody, we still have some dark days ahead, I think. Uh, we've got to get this current surge under control, and uh, it will take, you know, this country several months to be able to effectively vaccinate our population. Um, so the, the, the vigilance to our um, to all of the basic public health messages uh, around physical distancing, masking, minding stay at home orders, hand hygiene, um, isolating and quarantining when necessary are all going to be critical moving forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, these numbers are staggering and that's, you know, unfortunately nothing new and this is no small undertaking that you have to keep our campus safe and healthy. So thank you for your good work. We have a number of excellent questions in a very short time, but I'll start with um, one that got a number of likes and wants to be answered. Um, the newly announced California Notify smartphone app, does that fit in with UCI's efforts? Anything you can share about that? Sure. So it is a, really a companion tool that, um, that um, contact tracers up and down the state will use and the public health departments will use. It's an ability for your phone to be able to, uh, if, you, if you just choose to enroll in the program, um, it's, it's an opportunity for your phone to be used as a beacon to let, let, um, let you know if you've been around somebody who is COVID positive using the technology there with all of the privacy built in, you can opt in, you can opt out, but if you become COVID positive, you receive a code that you upload, it lets all of the people that have been around you uh, and in close contact know. It is completely anonymous, so it's not reported to us in contact tracing, it's reported to you, the individual, uh, that then allows you to take action, but know that you've possibly been exposed to somebody that you may not otherwise have known and can take appropriate actions. And certainly, um, if folks begin to receive those notifications and they're part of the campus community, we would love them to call the contact tracing program and let us know at 949-824-2300 and we can uh, provide guidance and support about what to do with that information once you receive it. Thank you. There's a number of other questions about students. So uh, two parts. What are the regulations for students that are living on campus that may intend to visit family or travel for the holidays and return back to their living accommodations on campus? And if they come back and they are ill, what is the quarantine process? We know that this was a little controversial in the beginning of the academic year at some other institution. So curious what you can tell us about student travel and quarantine. Sure, a couple of things to say about that. Um, student Affairs, I believe yesterday, sent out communication to students about travel related to end of, um, uh, end of the winter quarter and the winter break. Um, a, a couple of pieces of information there. We really want to know what students are planning to do that will help us in planning for the health and safety of our community as folks return. We're strongly recommending that students not return, if they do leave campus for the winter break, that they not return to campus until the weekend of January 16th. All courses will be remote for the two, first two weeks of, of campus and probably 
uh, for a significantly longer period of time based on stay at home orders, et cetera. Um, but that, that you, you really use that two weeks after the holidays to be able to quarantine at home before you travel back. We're gonna ask then that students when they return to campus um, uh, the weekend of the 16th that they um, test within 48 hours of return, test again in seven days. If they have two negative tests seven days apart, um, uh, then we would allow them to um, kind of get back to life as is allowed by current um, stay at home orders or other orders. But we would ask them to sequester for those seven days between those two tests when they return. If students have uh, academic challenges or other challenges and need to return before uh, um, January 16th, we understand that. And we would um, have similar steps in place for testing within 48 hours of return, core, uh, sequestering um, in between tests before you're able to be released. But the goal really is um, not to have COVID um, leave the campus and not to have COVID come back to the campus. And that's very challenging. We've seen a bit of an uptick from Thanksgiving um, in cases here on campus associated with Thanksgiving travel. So individuals who may have gone home and been exposed to, to sick, sick individuals at home then coming back, becoming COVID positive themselves. I suspect that will be uh, the case with winter return as well. So anything we can do um, to allow people to get a little bit of distance between their holiday gatherings at home that two weeks um, and come back the 16th would really be what we recommend for our students. Thank you. So this was 30 minutes chock full of very useful information. Um, I would like to direct our audience to the UCI COVID-19 dashboard that is on this slide. I've also added it in the chat. We will follow up with the link and perhaps any other useful resources, David, that you wish to share with our audience. Um, also some information on how you can support UCI in these efforts. So with that, thank you so much for your time again and the good work that you are doing to keep our campus safe and healthy. And I appreciate that you are optimistic that there will be better active, happy, healthy days ahead. Um, with that, this is our 10th and final lunchtime lecture of 2020. On behalf of the UCI program in public health, thank you all for following along and being with us. We wish you a happy and very healthy holiday season and new year. So thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, David. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.